And so Professor Martin Werner is the pro warden, current pro warden international at Goldsmith. So obviously this is key for this symposium. He was previously the pro warden research and enterprise at Goldsmith, and he was also the head of my department in computing before that. He's uh, a specialist in particular in multidisciplinary research that links to computing. And he has contributed uh, in books, in hundreds of publications, in particular at the intersection of technology and creative practice. He has focused on the problem of what is creativity in the context of art, music, education, and computing. Uh, recently, he was the co-chair of a special track, AI and Art, definitely relevant here, in 2015 at the International Joint Conference uh, in AI, Artificial Intelligence, Ishkai, for those who are in the know. He recently co-founded the UK's Practice Research Advisory Group, which advocates practice-based research, <coughs> which is fundamental to Goldsmith in particular. He has spent a sabbatical at Sony, uh, Computer Research Labs in Paris. He is a uh, claim a well-known jazz pianist. Uh, mm -hmm. He has performed with his own ensemble as well, uh, and has been praised by the BBC, The Guardian, The Observer, uh, for example. So it is my pleasure, with his background in arts and technology, to introduce Professor Martin Zorn. Thank you, Richard. So luckily, I'm an improvised jazz musician because I've been told to make this talk between 3 and 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so wish me luck. Um, can I say again, Alan, to uh, uh, the Warden's warm welcome to our visitors here today. It really is a very special day and we do warmly welcome all of you um, here. Uh, I would just say thing I do, I do uh, a slightly personal note before I talk about more general things. I have a great love of Japan, both through my, as a musician and as a scientist. Uh, I was lucky enough, I think I was 21, 22, to tour Japan uh, as a musician. And I, this was mostly in Kushu. I spoke no English, I really. So I spoke no Japanese. I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> I was learning English. Um, and and, uh, and the, the musicians in Kushu spoke no English. They could read, but there was really, there was, so there was no language between us. So we would go into a jazz club. The bass player would be there, the drummer would be there, and we'd look and we'd smile, but we couldn't say anything. But then we would say, autumn leaves, okay, one, or key, uh, G minor, called the key. And you would count it in and we would play music all night. And I did that every night, and it was one of the great joys of my life to play music in Japan for two months. And uh, I fell in love with Japan. I felt also had the great opportunity to work at Sony Computer Science Research Labs, which uh, a very great pioneer in the field of artificial intelligence, P Professor Mario Tokoro, with Luke Stills, who's arguably the European leader in artificial intelligence, set up a lab underpinning many of these values. How do we bring art and technology whilst thinking about the social responsibility, values around social justice, around democracy, around inclusion, around diversity? And, and Mario would always say, he'd always say, do, some, do research that no one else can do. Do research that no one else can do. And I think that is really exciting about why we're here today. I think there is research that the two institutions can do together, which no two other institutions in the world can. And it would be wrong of me not to tell you of how this story started. You can see I'm improvised. I've completely gone off script. So at some point, I might come back to this. Um, <laughs> I do want to acknowledge Professor Robert Zimmer, who is here, and he may put his hand up. He may not. Oh, you are here. Okay, I think you've gone for it. You saw that I was on. Yeah. It was really Robert Zimmer who had the vision to think about fashioning a computer science, a computing department, that really was um, uh, in the mould of some of the things that Pat was talking about earlier, something that really understood the creative industries, that showed innovation in practice. And it was Zimmer that says, we are going to create a world-leading creative computing department here at Goldsmiths. And that happened 15 years ago. And I think this is the culmination that we're sat here with a university as prestigious as Kyoto that we are talking about now, very strong international research relationships. And it's very much twofold. If you, the kind of compulsion to the artists have to make work, 
I would say, if I was going to define what is an artist, is someone who has to make work. And that desire, that compulsion, is, the, is, is part of what drives computer science as a research discipline in and of itself. It creates new agendas, it creates new opportunities, and it's pushing with the software engineer to say, I want to do this, I want to do something else, I want this data, I want you to visualise it in this way, this isn't enough. And then at the same time, technology providing an opportunity for different kinds of creative practice. Now, I think we have to be very careful. I, I'm probably saying things that you all know. But there are people who would like us to believe that machines, technology, can be creative in and of themselves. I think we have to be careful with technology. I think we, if there's a danger to anthropomorphism, I told you I was learning English at 22. I, I'm, I'm going to finish the course next week. Um, <laughs> uh, and there's a danger. So we, we have to be aware of those that say that artificial intelligence will take things over. Art is something that AI can never do. Art is a quintessentially human thing. We should think about technology as supporting, democratising, making available new opportunities for performance and for practice. And so that's the one thing that I would like us to bear in mind, something that we care about very much here. Uh, in the university, bringing together art practice, social science, humanities, understanding what it is to be human through the lens of technology, not to think about that which we can replace through using technology. So um, I'm looking at... I'm now, I'm now improvising. Are we... Am I still... Another five minutes? Another... Yes. Oh, longer, longer. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and lots of stories um, that I could tell you. Piano. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, so I won't play the piano, but what I, what I would like to do is offer our guests my latest jazz album. <laughs> so... Oh, thank you. Please, oh, yeah. Yeah. This was written uh, during my sabbatical working at Sony Computer Science Research Labs there four, year, four years ago or something. Anyway, um, please, as, as my... Um, so uh, Zimmer's vision did attract some world-leading researchers to come. And William Latham and Frederick Le Marie were two of those. This is very early on in the vision that, that, uh, that Zimmer had. Um, and Frederick was, I don't quite know when you came into the department, Frederick. I think it was just before me. Was it 2004 or 2005? Yes. He mm -hmm. came from Brown University. And uh, he had developed quite mathematically advanced graphics algorithms looking at using artificial intelligence and artificial evolution. Very soon afterwards, William, who, who is well known to many of us for his pioneering work with IBM around mid-1980s, and came essentially as a professor of art into a computing department. That was the kind of diversity that we saw uh, um, uh, uh, in the present, in the, the criticality of diversity for originality. Not only in terms of our subject mixes, why we all care about interdisciplinarity, but internationally through our diverse uh, um, set of uh, understandings of, of culture and value and the way that things, people work together. And that is, that, I think that's critical about to be original in research is to have that interdisciplinarity, have that internationality in what we do. So introducing Frederick's work to William, you will have to tell us one day how, how you guys met. But it gave the artist, it gave you William, didn't it, the first new models and technologies to realise some of the visions that you were trying to undertake as an artist. And then, but the other way around, part of what we were talking about earlier, it was William's art which gave Frederick new ways of thinking about what he was doing as well new approaches to his models, his algorithms, and the ways of thinking about how you represent <coughs> virtual space. Um, I think that there is, there is such a responsibility now for us at Goldsmiths to make sure that we are just not training engineers. We do not want the future of technology to be in companies, to be in the hands of those that would not think about the wider social ramifications. So it's really critical here that we enable designers and artists and social scientists and people working with humanities to learn to program. I think that's a critical part when we think about what it is that a university should be. We heard words like optimism, we heard words like diversity, we heard like, like originality. But I think there's also something that a university now has to create a sense of hope and, and optimism 
that we, as, as a, a set of universities around the world, can create a better future. And I think part of that is us all having access to what it is to learn to program. And we can exploit technology. So, for example, now, for the very first time, we can see how people learn. So, a big part of what Goldsys has done recently is we've devised online courses which are very much in that art technology sphere, creative coding. How do you go about thinking about programming as an arts practice? How are your aesthetic goals realised through the design of technologies to support them? And we're, we're getting to the stage now where we can actually see that people, when they learn in that way, with an arts-inflected pedagogy, actually learn in different ways. So I think there's opportunities for this technology to actually evidence for the first time the way in which we learn has actually been different and often better than perhaps in a more traditional way. Um, there's so much I want to say. Would you like me to? Would you like me to carry on? <laughs> Key games. So let's let's just think about this. So let me expand on that. So, supposing I wanted. So I'm thinking about that to to being in Kushu in a jazz club and playing the piano. Now artificial intelligence. There's a lot of hubris going around. Okay. I mean, I work in artificial intelligence. I know some of these people. And it goes back to what John McCarthy said in 1959 at Dartmouth, where all of the good and the great in the AI came together, and rather for political reasons, made grand statements about there is nothing that the human can do that AI won't be able to do in 20 years. That clearly, just the fact that AI has, has won at Go and won at uh, chess, hasn't really given us insights into what it is to be human. It hasn't given us an insight into what it is to play chess as a human, all the kinds of thinking that we need to do as humans to play well at Go and chess. And I think this is, this is fascinating. And what we will see, I believe, and the EPSRC, which is our major funding body for science research in this country, they're very interested in something called human-like computing. A, a, an odd word, an odd phrase. And what that is, is it's a reaction against machine learning, which is extremely powerful, which can do extraordinary things, but it can't tell you how it did it. Mm. It can't provide intuitive reasons behind why it made those decisions. And so I think that's something that we will see grow. I think we have a responsibility as we think about the relationship between technology and art. What are the creative ways we can use to explain the role of the system in the creative process? And then think through what does that mean in diagnosis or legal situations or other kinds of situations too. And I, th I think there is a responsibility here, that way of intuitively describing what we do within the creative process, and I think machines can play a role within that, uh, gives us a great opportunity to think through this idea of human-like computing. I think I'm holding you from your break. I, I'll, <laughs> should, should, so, I, so I do want to say, so I do want to just go back to the thing that, that all of us should feel empowered um, looking at how technology we can use that in creative practice, how we can use technology to democratise learning, to democratise access to the creative process. Um, and I would like to repeat what I said before. I do think there is something quite special about the approach that was led by Zimmer 15 years ago, and quite clearly in our presentations earlier, the way that you spoke about Kyoto University, your value system, your value system is so strongly aligned to that of Goldsmiths. I see this as a fantastic opportunity. Let us work together to do things that only the two institutions could do. And I look forward to that collaboration. And again, thank you for inviting me to talk here today. And good luck with the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you.